This is the second part of a video lecture on chapter one, which is dealing with uh, an orientation of the human body. Looking at section five, uh, anatomical terms, the learning objectives for this section include uh, the student describing anatomical position and using correct anatomical terms to describe uh, body directions, regions, planes, and sections. So, uh, looking at the uh, anatomical position and uh, directional terms, uh, the first thing is to understand what's meant by standard anatomical position. Uh, you can see the image here on the far right is a diagram showing uh, an individual actually standing in anatomical position. You can see they're standing up straight, uh, their feet are slightly apart uh, and facing forward. The palms are also uh, facing forward here. And when the palms face forward, that puts the thumbs facing towards the sides or lateral, uh, in the lateral direction. So overall, this is anatomical position. And this will be the position we will reference when we're uh, trying to find uh, parts of the body and when we're trying to uh, describe how parts move. Now we're going to look at some directional terms. Uh, they describe how one body structure is related to uh, other body structures. And the direction is always going to be based on these anatomical uh, position uh, that we just described. Uh, the right, it's important to know that the right and the left are going to refer to the body being viewed, not yours. Okay, so uh, it's not the observer, it's uh, the body that you're viewing or the model or the patient's uh, right or left side. So here is a table. Uh, showing the uh, directional terms. Superior and inferior are kind of opposite of each other. Looking at superior, that means towards the head uh, and or upper part of the structure of the body uh, or, uh, or above. So we see this direction above going up there. That would be in the superior direction. An example given here is the head is superior uh, to the abdomen. So the head is above uh, the abdominal area there. And then for inferior, which in humans is also caudal, uh, is going to be away from the head or toward the lower part of a structure or the body or below are ways to interpret inferior. So that's overall in that direction. And an example here is the navel or belly button is inferior to the chin. So here would be the navel. The navel is inferior to uh, the chin, so the navel is inferior to it. And then we have another pair of terms here, anterior and posterior, and in humans we can also use uh, ventral to mean anterior and dorsal to mean uh, posterior. Now anterior is going to mean towards the front and posterior would mean towards the back. Uh, but towards the front in humans that stand up straight, that's also the belly side, which is uh, ventral. Uh, and the back is the dorsum or dorsal side, so uh, the two terms can be used interchangeably. So for anterior, we're towards the front, uh, body part would be towards the front, and posterior, uh, the body part is toward the back. So looking at an example of uh, anterior, the breastbone, which is also called the sternum, is going to be anterior or in front of the spine. Since the spine is in the back, the breastbone is anterior to it. And then for a posterior example, the heart is going to be posterior to your breastbone. Uh, so uh, the sternum uh, up in front and the heart is behind that, so the heart would be posterior. And then we have another pair of terms, medial and lateral. Medial is going to mean towards the midline of the body uh, or on the inner side of. Right, and lateral is going to be the opposite. It's going to be away from the midline or on the outer side of. And so example here uh, in the first one for medial, the heart uh, is going to be medial to the arm. And an example for lateral, the arm, the arms are going to be lateral to the chest or toward the outside. And another term you may have seen sometimes is intermediate, which is going to be between uh, a more medial and a more lateral structure, so uh, somewhere between medial and lateral. An example here would be your collarbone, which is right here, is going to be intermediate between the breastbone, which is your sternum, and your shoulder. So the breastbone here, the shoulder here, 
and the collarbone would be intermediate to that. And then we have another pair of terms here, proximal and distal. Proximal means closer, and distal means further from, and, and closer and further from what? So for proximal, we're talking about closer to the origin of the body. So usually when we're looking at this, this would, we would be talking about limbs. Uh, and so the closest point would be where the limbs are attached. Like at the shoulder, that would be proximal most. Uh, at uh, the hip would be proximal most for the lower limbs. Uh, distal would be the opposite, would be furthest uh, from the origin or further from the origin uh, of the body or the, the main portion of the body, the trunk. Uh, so here we would be talking about going towards uh, the tips of the, of the fingers are going towards the toes on your limbs. So an example of proximal here would be the elbow is going to be proximal to the wrist. So when we compare it to the wrist, uh, right here, your elbow is actually more proximal to it. And then for distal, the knee is going to be distal to the thigh. So the knee is over here midway down the leg, and then your thigh is up higher. So the, the knee would be uh, distal to it. Uh, and then we have another pair of terms that are opposite of each other. We have superficial and deep. Uh, superficial is going to mean, mean more towards the surface of the body, and uh, deep would mean uh, away from the body's surface. So example here, your skin would be superficial to skeletal muscles. It's the muscles underneath, so the skin is superficial. And then example for deep, is the lungs, and the lungs are going to be deeper to the skin. So the lungs are found deeper within uh, your chest, and the skin is on the outside, so the lungs are deep compared to that skin. So now we're going to look at regional terms, and we can divide the body up into regions, and uh, before we do that, we can divide the body into uh, two major divisions. They include the axial, uh, which is the main axis of the body, where you find the head, the neck, and the trunk of the body, and then we're looking to look at the limbs or the appendages, and that would be the appendicular division. Uh, again, so that's the arms and the legs. Uh, now, each of these can be further uh, divided uh, to reference certain regions. So these would be regional terms, uh, and those are going to be found within each of those major body divisions. So what we're looking at here are uh, some of those uh, regional uh, terms. And this view right here of, uh, in the diagram is the anterior side or the front side of the, uh, in the diagram. And so you can see some major subdivisions uh, of these regions. For example, cephalic uh, right up here. Uh, that's for the head. And then we have the cervical, which is the neck. And then the thoracic, abdominal, pelvic area, uh, the pubic area there. And then we have upper limb. Uh, which is your, the, uh, your arm, and then the manus, which is the hand, and then your lower limb, uh, and then the pedal or foot. Uh, so each of these has a, uh, 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 can be divided further. It's like your forehead is going to be the frontal. Um, and I can't write when I'm zoomed in, so I'm just going to point to them, uh, to these terms here. So right up here on your forehead would be the frontal, and then where your eyes are found, that would be the orbital uh, right there. And then where your nose is a nasal. And then buckle for the cheek, oral for the mouth, and the chin would be mental. Again, the neck is cervical. Uh, and in this diagram, we don't have any subdivisions there. Uh, for the thoracic, uh, we can divide the thoracic region into uh, subregions. The sternal would be where the sternum is found. So that's right there where the breastbone is. Um, Right underneath the armpit area, that would be axillary. And then uh, around the region where uh, the nipple is would be the mammary region. And then if you look at uh, where your muscle is right here, the muscle you would work out when you're doing push-ups, that would be uh, the pectoral region, uh, the shoulder region. Uh, and then looking at the abdominal, we're gonna look at more detail at the abdominal region, but for now we're just gonna look at a subregion called the umbilical, uh, and we'll see that there'll be more um, as we uh, progress through this uh, presentation. Uh, and then for the pelvic region here, uh, along the sides of the lower abdomen there, that's the uh, inguinal region or growing. And then you also have uh, the pubic or genital region. Uh, looking at the anterior side of the upper arm, and I went ahead and I scratched out 
uh, some of the terms because this uh, original diagram had the other view of the body on the right side, which is looking at the, the dorsal view. And so those terms were pointing at an image that isn't there. So I got rid of those terms uh, for us here. Uh, when we go look at the dorsal uh, view, uh, I'm going to go ahead and scratch out the ones you can see here. And then we'll see the ones that I scratched out on the other diagram. So looking here, uh, right at that uh, point of the shoulder, that's the chromial uh, of the upper arm. The brachial is right here in the arm where you have your bicep uh, and your tricep. Uh, of the arm muscles and then right here in the front of the elbow that's the anti-cubital uh, where it'll typically draw blood when they take blood at the doctors uh, and then uh, the forearm is referred to as the anti-brachial and then the carpal which is where the wrist is looking at the hand for the manus you have the palmer the palm of your hand the thumb has a specific name the pollux and then overall uh, your fingers are referred to as digital uh, region. And then looking at the lower limb here, the hip is referred to coxal. Uh, where the thigh is, is femoral, right here. And then your kneecap is the patellar region. In fact, the name of the kneecap is the patella. And then the leg, which is the lower part of your lower limb here, is called a crural. And then uh, the side of the, uh, of the leg there is fibular or a peritoneal. Uh, in fact, there's a bone that goes right there on the lateral side of the leg. It's called the fibula. So that's uh, kind of what make that easy to remember if you learn fibula. And then for the foot region, your ankle bones overall are called tarsals. And then uh, the bones that come or the region after that is the metatarsal region. And there's bones called metatarsals there. And then you have your digital region. And just like the thumb, the big toe has a specific uh, name for it. Where the big toe is that the hallux uh, region and the name of the, the big toe digit is the hallux. Now we're going to look at the posterior uh, view and starting up here at the top in the head region, the cephalic region, we have the otic which is where the ear is located. We have the occipital which is the back of the head and then again the neck region is cervical just like uh, on the anterior view. Uh, looking at uh, the dorsal area there, you have the scapula, uh, scapular, and there's actual bone of the, of the skeleton called the scapula or shoulder blade. Where the backbone is, that's the vertebral region. Uh, the lower back is the lumbar. And then right in here where the pelvis is, uh, you have the sacral region, and that's where uh, a bone called the sacrum is. So it's the sacral region. And then you have the gluteal region. And then the area between the anus and the external genitalia is called the perineal uh, region there. Looking at the upper limb here, again, I've now scratched out uh, structures or, or regions that were seen in the anterior view. So that now we can see uh, just the posterior view. Uh, and we can still see the, uh, the end of the shoulder there, the acromial uh, region. We can still see the antibrachial. Uh, the back side of the elbow is called the lacrimal uh, um, region there. And then our forearm is still antibrachial. Looking at the hand, uh, we still have digital there and we have the metacarpals, kind of like in the front we had the metatarsals. So that would be the metacarpal region. And then looking at the lower limb, the thigh region is called femoral or femoral region. The back of the knee is the popliteal region and the calf region is called the sural and again the outside uh, or the lateral side of the leg is still called fibular. I recommend going with that one since it'll make it easy to learn the fibula when we learn the bones. The fibular region is where you find the fibula, a bone. Uh, and your heel uh, is uh, referred to as the calcaneal region. In fact the name of the specific tarsal there is the calcaneus so the calcaneal region is where you find a bone called the calcaneus and then underneath the foot is the plantar uh, region uh, so those are some of the regions um, describing locations of uh, the anatomy of the body and so now we're going to look at body planes and uh, for body planes um, these are going to be surfaces along which uh, the body or structures may be cut for anatomical study. A lot of times we need to look inside the body and we need to cut through it. 
And so the three most common planes that will cut the body along include the sagittal, uh, frontal, and transverse. And there's also some other names for the frontal coronal and then horizontal. Now, if we cut the body along these planes, then those sections will take that name. So if we cut a body down the sagittal uh, 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 plane, then would be called a sagittal cut or a sagittal section, for example. Uh, so if you're going to look at the sagittal plane, this would be a plane that if we put that plane through the body, would cut the body into right and left parts. Okay, so that's the key there for sagittal. So you see the image here, they show a plane going right through uh, the midline of the body, cutting it into exact right and left sides. Um, so again, this is going to produce a sagittal section. And if we go right through the middle, then it's going to be called a mid-sagittal section. And if we go off to the side away from the middle, then it would be called a parasagittal plane. Uh, so you're cutting off center. Then they have a radiological image down here showing a mid-sagittal section uh, through the abdominal pelvic region. You can see the backbone uh, right in there. Um, this would be the gluteal areas. This is the posterior side and here would be the anterior side of the body. And so you can look inside the, the body uh, uh, with what is a mid-sagittal uh, section. Uh, and then we have the frontal or coronal plane, and here uh, the key is you're gonna you're gonna cut the the body into front and back or anterior and posterior uh, section. So you can see the plane here in the drawing, uh, and that would cut the body into uh, front and back parts. It's also called a coronal uh, plane, so we can call it a frontal or coronal section. And here you see some imaging on the bottom image there. Uh, with the thoracic area, as you can see, we have a frontal uh, uh, plane view uh, that shows us the lungs and the heart, and uh, we've even cut through the head of the of the of the humerus uh, bone, which is found in the brachial region. And then we have a transverse, it's also called a horizontal plane. Uh, and sometimes when you cut the body in this way, they'll refer to it as a cross section as well. And you can cut along uh, several areas going that way. And anytime you do, it's going to be called a transverse uh, plane and, and uh, would produce cross sections. So you actually have an image here, um, imaging, uh, that shows a cross sectional view uh, through what looks like based on the names of the organs, the liver, and the spleen, which are found in the abdominal cavity. So this would be going right through uh, the abdominal cavity where you find these organs, including. Um, pancreas. Now if you cut at any other angle than 90, uh, like you'll see here in the uh, uh, transverse section, this would be a 90 degree or perpendicular to the main axis of the body. So if we cut at any other angle, let's say we cut a plane going this way through the body, uh, that's at an, at an angle other than 90 degrees, we would call that an oblique section. So sometimes you'll see uh, views inside the body of uh, a section other than the three main ones. So looking at uh, the uh, uh, this multiple choice question here, it says all of the following are correct positioning when placing the body in anatomical position except so one of those is incorrect when it comes to going in the anatomical position. Is it A, the feet are slightly apart? Is it B, the palms are facing forward? Is it C, the body is standing at attention? Or is it D, the thumbs are pointing medially? So we're now going to look at section six, which is uh, going to cover the body cavities and membranes uh, here. So your learning outcomes for this section are to be able to locate uh, and name the major body cavities and their subdivisions and associated membranes and list the major organs contained within them. So not only do you have to recognize body cavities, but you've got to know what organs, uh, major organs you can find within those body cavities. And then you're going to be looking at uh, naming for the four quadrants and the nine regions that the uh, abdominal pelvic cavity uh, can be divided into and also list the organs that are uh, contained within those regions or quadrants. So uh, taking a look at uh, uh, the body overall, the body is going to contain um, 
uh, internal cavities that are closed to the environment. And the cavities are going to provide uh, different degrees of protection to organs that are, that are within there. Uh, there's two uh, general uh, or major uh, body cavities. One is on the back side is the dorsal and uh, the other one is the ventral body cavity. And the diagram on the right shows them here uh, from both uh, uh, lateral view and anterior view. The lateral view would be kind of like a sagittal section, mid sagittal section, and then the anterior view would be, be produced by a coronal or frontal section. You can see the dorsal uh, body cavity is colored in yellow and the uh, ventral body cavity is in red and the same is true on the diagram on the right. So those are the two major uh, cavities where we find our organs. Uh, so we're going to look at the dorsal body cavity uh, first uh, and uh, the what's found in here this cavity is going to be those cavities are going to provide protection for the nervous system. Uh, and so you're going to have two major divisions. You're going to have the cranial and the vertebral cavity. Uh, so the cranial is going to encase the brain and the vertebral cavity is going to uh, encase the spinal cord. So let's just take a look and zoom in quickly there. Looking at the lateral view, uh, sagittal uh, section view, uh, this would be the cranial cavity where the brain is located. And then along the backbone or the spinal column, you have the uh, vertebral cavity that has the spinal cord and then you can see from the front view here uh, looking at the anterior view your ventral cavity is kind of in the way of seeing the rest of the uh, vertebral cavity where the spinal cord is since the spinal cord is posterior to this it runs behind there uh, within the backbone and then your cranial cavity up there where the brain is located uh, and now we're going to look at uh, uh, the, the body cavity here, uh, the ventral body cavity, and in general, this one is going to contain your viscera. The viscera is just another name for your uh, internal organs overall, like your intestines, stomach, uh, heart, so on. Uh, and we can divide into two divisions here, the thoracic cavity, which is up in the chest, and then the abdominal and pelvic or abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, it's actually two separate uh, cavities, or we can separate the two cavities and we combine them. We just pull this little trick by using an O and combining the two. So an abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, so taking a look at the thoracic cavity more closely, um, we, it's actually divided into uh, some sections we'll take a look at right now. Uh, we have two pleural cavities where the lungs are going to be located. Uh, so there, you have the left and right where the left and right lungs are. And then you have a central area uh, or division of the thoracic cavity, uh, cavity called the mediastinum. And the mediastinum is going to contain, uh, uh, or part of it's going to be containing the heart. So we'll call that part that contains the heart of the mediastinum uh, called the pericardial cavity. So that's why it's put as a sub bullet under mediastinum. Um, uh, the mediastinum is also going to surround other thoracic organs. Uh, which include the esophagus, where food goes from the mouth to the stomach, and the trachea, uh, which is the windpipe. So let's take a look and zoom in uh, real quick here at the diagram. So you can see on the lateral view here, on the ventral cavity in red, there's your thoracic cavity, and then you have your abdominal cavity and your pelvic cavity, or abdominal pelvic combined there. And the two are separated by the diaphragm, which is a breathing muscle. You can see this muscle goes all the way across and completely separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal uh, cavity here. Now remember that one of the objectives says that you just need to know what kind of organs you find in there. So the organs you find in the thoracic cavity include the heart and the lungs. For the abdominal cavity, you're going to uh, contain the digestive viscera. So you're talking about your stomach, your uh, large intestine, small intestine, for example. And then your pelvic cavity down here, which is found within the hip bone uh, and uh, or the, the two hip bones in the pelvis area, area uh, where the pelvis is, the pelvic cavity, uh, that's where you find the urinary bladder and reproductive organs and the rectum, which is the last part of the large intestine. Now, if we look at the uh, anterior view, we can see the two pleural cavities where the right and the left lung are located. And then the central cavity here, 
uh, the central area within the thoracic cavity is actually separated from the pleura. And there you have the mediastinum. And part of the mediastinum is divided further to enclose the heart. Uh, and that would be called the pericardial cavity there. Uh, so again, make sure you're familiar with uh, what's found in the pleuras, the lungs. What's found in the pericardial cavity is the heart. Uh, and overall, uh, collectively, all of that together is referred to as a thoracic cavity, which is separated from the abdominal cavity by the diaphragm. And your pelvic cavity, which has the urinary bladder, reproductive organs, rectum, is going to be found there within the pelvis, which includes the hip bones there. So moving along, we've already talked about uh, what you find there in the abdominal cavity, stomach, intestines, spleen, and liver are also included in there. So those are things to know. Um, and the pelvic cavity, which we've already pointed out here in the diagram, which is down there toward the bottom, includes the urinary bladder, reproductive organs, and the rectum, last part of the, um, uh, the large intestine. So uh, oftentimes this book is gonna bring up what happens when uh, uh, things go wrong uh, in the body and, and uh, medical problems occur. Well, what we create is what is called a homeostatic imbalance. So there's gonna be a lot of these little side notes uh, that are relevant to what we're studying at the time. Uh, so looking at this first homeostatic imbalance of the book, uh, here problems can occur when structures stray into a neighboring cavity. So in other words, when an organ, uh, because of uh, tear, um, in the membranes to separate the cavity, uh, structure may move into the other one. And an example is a hiatal hernia. And here in this case, part of the stomach is gonna protrude uh, through the diaphragm uh, into the thoracic cavity. Uh, this can push the stomach acid into the esophagus and that can cause irritation. The esophagus is the, the, the structure that the food goes down into the stomach. Um, and uh, we might refer to this uh, irritation as heartburn. And severe cases of a hiatal hernia, hernia are, are going to require surgery to repair. So now we're going to look at uh, membranes that we find within the ventral body cavity. And these are going to be collectively called uh, serous membranes. We'll talk about serous membranes later on in the semester as well. Uh, they're also, it's also called serosa. Uh, and plural would be uh, serosi. We just add the E at the end there. So serosa would be singular, serosity would be plural. And what these are, are going to be membranes that are double layered. And they're going to cover the surface of the ventral body cavity. And there's two things that can be covered, two surfaces. First of all, the wall of the cavity itself. So like you're in the thoracic region, the inside wall of that thoracic cavity uh, can be lined or will be lined with a serosa. And so that would be called a parietal, the one that lines the wall itself. And then you're going to have a serous membrane that actually covers the surface of an organ, like the lung, for example, and that would be called visceral serosa. Remember, the term viscera, just mentioned a while ago, means internal organ. So the visceral serosa covers the organ, the, the parietal serosa is going to line the wall, um, and the two are going to be uh, continuous with each other, so one runs into the other. Uh, we'll see, uh, we'll try to do a little thought experiment to see how that might work. Now the two um, uh, serous membranes, or two serosi, the parietal and visceral, are going to be separated by a small thin cavity or a space between the two. And these membranes are going to secrete a serous fluid in there, and that fluid helps provide lubrication. So as these organs move around and move past each other, that helps to lubricate uh, uh, the organ. So, uh, so let's do a little thought experiment. We see the view right here. They show uh, in the diagram here how these membranes might, how we might visualize these membranes. So picture that you blow up a balloon, a round balloon where uh, the balloon is not blown up fully, and you can stick your fist into the balloon. And as you do, the balloon is going to wrap around your fist tightly. That layer of the balloon that wraps around your fist tightly is analogous to the visceral serosa. And so that would be all lining right around your, your fist there. And then this balloon is still continuous and then part of that balloon will stretch out over and go outward like this. And that would be the membrane that surrounds the cavity or covers the cavity, uh, the body cavity itself. And then you can see right there in the middle, you have that space 
uh, between the visceral and parietal serosa, and that would be the space that's going to be filled with the serous fluid. Uh, and so you can see an example here with the heart. The heart itself will be lined with uh, visceral serosa, and then that visceral serosa comes outward. And then between the two serosi, you're going to have a space there that would be filled with uh, serous fluid. Now, if things seem a little bit complicated, well, these uh, serous membranes will have some specific names depending on uh, uh, where we are in the body. So if we're talking about where the lungs are, the pleural cavity, the name of the serous membranes there are called pleury because it's the pleural cavity. So if we're talking about surrounding the lungs there, uh, right in this area here. So lining the wall of the thoracic cavity here would be the parietal. So you're gonna use that same term for the wall the parietal pleura, that's singular, okay? Pleury with the E is gonna be plural. So we have parietal pleura, and then lining the co or covering the lung itself would be the visceral pleura. So we have combined parietal and visceral pleury. Pleury would be with an E, and in the middle would be a serous fluid that helps to uh, lubricate. Now, remember the heart is located in the pericardial cavity. Well, the name of the serous membranes there are called, the peri uh, each one is called a pericardium. So again, you have your parietal and your visceral. And uh, the two are gonna be pericardia. Pericardia would be plural for pericardium. So. You have a parietal pericardium, a visceral pericardium, and the two combined are the pericardia, okay? Uh, and then if you go into the abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? So you go into the abdominal pelvic cavity, and here we have a transverse section. We're looking from above there. This would be the liver, uh, the stomach, the major blood vessels. And this is the back side or the posterior side, and this is the belly side, the anterior side, and we section right through the body there. And if you look closely here, let me just zoom in real quick here. You can see that the body wall itself is going to be lined. There's a little red uh, red line going along there. And then the liver and the stomach and so on are going to be covered with a serous membrane as well. Okay, so these membranes are going to be referred to as peritoneum. So you're going to have your visceral peritoneum that lines the organs. And then lining the body wall is the parietal. Uh, peritoneum, and the cavity within there would be called the peritoneal cavity, which is filled with serous fluid. Again, this is, all of this is, they're all the same. They're serous fluids, but we just have specific names depending on where you're at. If you're at the lungs, it's the pleury. If you're in the abdominal cavity, it's the peritoneum, uh, peritonea. If you're with the heart in the pericardial cavity, it's the pericardium, uh, the names for those membranes and all of them secrete serous fluid into the into the space uh, between the two uh, membranes so uh, looking at another homeostatic imbalance here uh, your uh, serous membranes can become inflamed uh, as a result of infection or some sort of irritation uh, and inflammation is always going to be associated with pain so normally these smooth layers or these serous membranes uh, can become uh, rough and can even stick to each other and that's going to cause some very severe pain. And I remember when I was a kid, uh, I had some very severe pain, uh, real severe pain in the chest, kind of uh, toward where the heart is. And I went to the doctor and they said I had an infection in the lining of the lung. What he was actually talking about was I had uh, a swelling occurring in the pleury, which are the, the serous membranes of the, of the pleural cavity where the lungs are located. So in this example, in these exa examples of these types of conditions include pleurisy or peritonitis. Peritonitis would be in the peritoneal cavity where the, uh, uh, abdominal, where the uh, abdominal organs are located. And then uh, the last uh, uh, little subsection in here is going to be how we divide the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, if you're going to go into medicine, uh, a lot of times they'll use quadrants. Uh, quadrants mean four, so we're going to divide into upper and lower, right and left. So again, we're going to, uh, a lot of times medical personnel would uh, feel more comfortable doing this. So example, 
you might have pain in the right lower quadrant and then they write that down in your medical notes and the pain is real severe well, guess what that's where the appendix is located with a real severe pain that might suggest that you have appendicitis and they have to do uh, a little more checking on you and determine whether or not they need to remove that uh, because it could be dangerous if the uh, swelling leads to a rupture uh, in there so uh, again your goal is to make sure you know and can identify where these uh, quadrants are you have your right upper quadrant uh, which is the upper right area then you have your left upper quadrant then you have your right lower and you remember it's the diagram or the other individual's right side and their left not yours and then over here we have the left lower quadrant and so we look here and you look at some of the major organs here uh, like this one right here this organ right here is the stomach so most of the stomach here's some of the stomach over here on the other side but most of the stomach is going to be found in the left upper quadrant this what we want to do is kind of be familiar with where uh, some of these major organs are the spleen is also found up in this area here in the right upper quadrant right where i'm shading in there just on the inside of the the, the rib cage uh we're still we're, but we're in the abdominal cavity the abdominal cavity kind of curves upward into the thoracic region there uh, but we're still separated and separated by the the diaphragm most of the liver the mass of the liver is going to be found in the right upper quadrant whereas most of the stomach will be found in the left upper quadrant uh, you have uh, your appendix over here in the right lower quadrant. Uh, and over here, if you take a look, the urinary bladder is in the lower quadrants and it appears to be separated complete, uh, directly in half or exactly in half, half of the bladder on one side and half on the other. Now, anatomists are going to be a little more detailed here. And so they're going to divide into nine regions instead of quadrants. So these are nine divisions or regions. It's kind of like setting up a tic-tac-toe grid uh, over the abdominal region, abdominal pelvic region. And uh, the regions are all listed here. Uh, and so let's take a look at them in the diagram and then see what kind of organs you find uh, in each of these regions. And you're expected to know these for the laboratory um, and as well as for the lecture. So looking here, we've already covered uh, in the, earlier on in the notes, we've already covered this middle area where uh, the umbilical cord was attached, the umbilical scar, the navel is called the umbilical region. And you might recall that the stomach was located right up in here. And that's why we call this the epigastric, which means at the surface of the stomach, literally translated here. Okay. Now, uh, over here, you're gonna have a right and left and they go by the same name. It's called hypochondriac region. And hypo means underneath or below, hypo does. And chondro means cartilage. For your ribs, your ribs are made of bone uh, posteriorly or towards the back. But as the ribs come back around anteriorly, they uh, transition into cartilage, uh, rib cartilages. And so right here, you have cartilage as part of your rib cage. So you're literally talking about a region where there is cartilage and that region is underneath the cartilage. So that's a translation hypochondriac region. So this would be the left hypochondriac region. This would be the right hypochondriac region. And in the middle would be the epigastric region. And then you're going to have your right and your left lateral regions or also called lumbar because that's where you find your lower back area there. Uh, and then you're, you're going to have the right and left uh, on the lower uh, regions here, the inguinal uh, region. It's also called the iliac region because the part of the hip bone called the ilium is in that area there. Uh, so that would also be the right inguinal or uh, inguinal or the iliac region and the left inguinal or iliac region there. And then over here you have your pubic. It's also called the hypo. It's like this was just at the surface of the stomach. This would be below. Hypo means below. Uh, the stomach, so we can call that one the hypogastric region, or we can also call it the pubic region. So let's take a look at what kinds of organs we find uh, in there. Okay, you can see your liver, as we did in the earlier picture, your stomach there. You see most of your stomach is found in the epigastric region at the surface. Underneath there, you have your stomach here. Here you can see the little light area right here of the rib cage is made in cartilage. So over here, you have your hypochondriac region. And in there is where you have your spleen. Uh, 
Um, I may have said right, but this is the left. So this would be the left hypochondriac region because uh, it's the model's uh, left. And then over here on the right, you can see most of the liver in the right hypochondriac region over here. You also find the gallbladder, which is located right underneath the large portion of the, of the liver. So over here, this would be the right uh, uh, hypochondriac region. Then in your epigastric region, you see mostly you have mostly a small intestine in there. Uh, and then in your pubic region or hypogastric region, you can see you have your urinary bladder there. Behind this, you're gonna have uh, with more small intestine and even the rectum is uh, further back over there. Uh, and then over here, you're gonna have uh, your right inguinal region over here and that's where your appendix is. And this is where the start of the large intestine is and then the large intestine uh, is once your food is exited, the small intestine are trying to absorb nutrients, the waste will end up in the large intestine and then move up the ascending colon, which is another name for large intestine, the colon. Ascending going up and then we go across the transverse colon and then the descending colon eventually going towards the rectum, which is posterior to what we're seeing here. Right, so uh, over here we find the, uh, the appendix. When it comes to the part of the large intestine we find over here in the right lateral region, remember this is called the lumbar lateral region. In the right lateral region, we not only do we find, just find the colon or large intestine, this is where the ascending uh, colon is, so the part where the, food, the undigested food goes upwards and then across and then downwards, right? Uh, so then if we go to the other side here, which would be the left lateral or left lumbar region, that's where you find the descending, which means moving down colon or the part of that, that part of the large intestine. Before the intestine transitions into the rectum, it kind of makes this S-like shape, so they call that sigmoid, which means the sigmoid colon. So again, make sure you study these uh, different regions and don't confuse right and left side. It's the individual's right or left side. I think I might have said it incorrectly just a while ago. Uh, don't make that mistake when you're uh, doing a written test. Um, and then uh, make an effort to learn the major organs that you find in each of these regions. You should know the urinary bladder is going to be found in the pubic region uh, of the nine regions. Um, small intestine can be found in the umbilical and the epigastric is where you find the stomach. Gastro means stomach. Okay? And some of these other organs that I pointed out for you here, uh, those that are labeled for us. So at the very least, make an effort to learn, uh, learn these major organs and which regions they're in. So here we have some other cavities other than the those of the dorsal and the ventral cavity that we just covered. So we have some other cavities here and some of these are gonna be actually exposed or open to the environment outside. Uh, uh, one is the oral uh, cavity where the mouth is. So uh, we can see if we do a sagittal section through the head, uh, the food enters to the mouth and there's an oral cavity uh, right in here. This would be the tongue in cross section there. And then we have the nasal cavity, so air enters, and there's a cavity in there where air is going to enter up into the nasal cavity and then end up going down uh, towards the trachea and through the lungs. So the nasal cavity is also open. And then where your eyes are, the eye sockets right here, this, uh, in this area, we can see the orbital cavity. And then the ear, the middle ear cavity. So going we go into the ear there, there is the middle ear. Uh, cavities. And then there's another uh, um, cavity that we find where joints are, like your elbow, your knee, the jaw right here. These uh, joints that are that allow us to move uh, bones relative to each other are going to be called synovial joints, and they're enclosed. Uh, and they're going to have uh, a lubricating fluid in there, these synovial cavities. They're going to have synovial membranes that secrete a synovial fluid. So it's kind of similar to that serous membranes we were talking about earlier that produce serous uh, fluid. The synovial cavities will produce uh, synovial fluid. So just to uh, kind of check out the diagram over here on the right, they're actually pointing at a joint between two vertebrae. And they show that the joints, if we section through there, they're sealed off and they're going to be lined. 
with a membrane. Uh, it's going to be called a synovial membrane. And in there is a cavity called the synovial cavity where the synovial fluid will, will be released in there, secreted in there, and allows to lubricate the joint as the joint moves. So uh, now we have uh, multiple choice questions. The body cavity, which houses the lung, is known as... Uh, so we're talking about body cavities. I think this would be uh, ventral body, part of the ventral body cavity. Is it going to be the pelvic cavity? Uh, A, is it B, the cranial cavity? Is it C, the pericardial cavity? Or is it D, the pleural cavity? Again, we're asking about where the lungs are located. Of course, we could ask about any one of these cavities. That's just an example question. And then, which of the following covers an organ? Is it A, parietal pericardium, B, parietal pleura, C, visceral pericardium, or D, parietal peritoneum? So those are actually all the uh, serous membranes. Uh, and the question is, which one uh, of those choices specifically would be covering an organ? So that's it for uh, this chapter.